31st, haunted house in space. <laughs> I awoke inside a coffin. I didn't know my name. Silence surrounded me. All was dark, but three finger-sized holes. I wasn't lying down, nor was I quite standing. I was positioned diagonally. I could move, but it took great effort. Stiffness held my limbs, torso, and head. The stuffy air made it unpleasant to breathe. Motes of dust danced in the meager light like dirty snow. The only sounds were my sharp, tense breaths and a deep, monotonous drone from somewhere outside the coffin. I didn't know where I was or why I was here, but I knew it couldn't be good. I strained to lift my hands and pushed against the wooden door. A splinter jabbed into my right palm and I cursed. The door hardly budged, but I heard the clink of a latch. It was locked. I was locked in. Involuntary moans of dread escaped my lips. They liquefied into sobs. Not very heroic, I know, but fuck you, you weren't there. I wondered if I would die here. Would I starve, die of thirst, run out of air? Would someone come to kill me? I tried again to force the door open using all the leverage and strength I could muster. No luck. I considered crying out for help, but I still had some dignity. Besides, I highly doubt you ever put me in this coffin would show any semblance of mercy, no matter how much I begged did put me in here anyway. Memories didn't flood back to me the way they do in the movies. Instead, they trickled in a little at a time. First, I saw a woman in a window of a house with white, translucent walls. The wideness of her eyes and the curl of her lips told me she feared something. Like me, she was a prisoner. She was the girl on the borderland. Those four words made my body cease. Somehow, I knew she was the reason I was here. A loud, metallic bang jolted me. A slightly quieter plink followed me. The lid to the coffin yawned open. I stepped out and into a dusty room. Though I could see somewhat well, I detected no actual light source. Cobwebs hung from the ceiling like withered vines. The walls were cinder block and filled with age. The floor was dirt. Up ahead, a staircase ascended into darkness. Behind me, other coffins leaned against the wall. The door to the one I staggered out of had the, had the words Moon Boy carved into it. I thought that might be my name, but that couldn't be right. That wasn't a real name. The other coffins had names carved onto them, too. Greta Graves, Pumpkin Ghost. My head was starting to hurt. I wanted to sit on the ground and was dirty. A skeletal hand punched through the dirt not five inches from my feet. I yelped and leapt back. Another hand reached up beside me, dirt collecting around its forearm as it stretched rotting fingers. The dirt parted for another set of dead man's hands, dead man's hands, beside me. In the two remaining coffins, people were screaming. Another set of hands dug its way out of the nearby dirt. A head joined the first set. Its eyes were sunken and dark, its flesh gray, and an easing nasal cavity glistened where its nose should have been. Only shreds were made of its lips, and worms writhed between its teeth. The zombie rose from the dirt to the exposed ribs of its mostly hollow torso. It stepped out of the ground with anorexic legs. Papery flesh hung from the bones of its limbs. The rotted state of its genitals rendered the corpse sexless. Only gray flaps of mottled skin dangled between its legs. The zombie moaned and reached for me. I stumbled backwards and bumped into another. <coughs> this one was, stickery, was sticky, fresher. I pushed away and headed for the stairs. The three zombies in pursuit. One of them I thought looked like me. I bounded up the stairs. I reached for something to brace myself against. There was no railing, only a clay wall. My hand sunk into it. Something crawled up my forearm. I slapped at whatever it was, daring not to look. I pulled my hand from the wall and ran forward. At the head of the stairs, I stopped at the door. It had three finger-sized holes at high level. I reached for the knob and felt none. Behind me, I was suddenly cramped. The monotonous drone had resumed, or maybe it had never stopped. I heard no more screaming, no more moaning zombies, only my sharp, tense breaths, and that drone from somewhere nearby I was back in the coffin again. Fuck. God damn it. I kicked the door but lacked the space to build a much force. The scream welled up inside me. Before I could expel it, the door ripped open, filling the same unfinished basement, but now the zombies were already out, waiting for me. Their hands fell upon me. I tried to twist from their grasp. The droning grew louder, less monotonous. I thought maybe it was speaking. I screamed world fell away like so many crumbling blocks. The drone, the undead moans, my scream synthesized into a looped sample from Season of the Witch by Donovan. But I wasn't home, and I hadn't been dreaming since the day I tried to write that beat. I was at the quarry's edge and all alone. The floating house was a pile of rubble at the bottom of the pit. A dark crack had opened in the opposite cliff wall. 
Dust clouds danced in the air around it. I tried to move, but everything hurt. We'd done what we came here to do, but it no longer sat right with me. I couldn't shake the nailing feeling that we'd all been deceived. The loop sample reverberated all around us as it played from invisible speakers. Using all my strength, I pressed myself to my hands. I called for Greta, Pumpkin Ghost, I called for Kip and Jamie. No one responded, no one was around. Under the repeated measures from the song, we heard no crickets, birds, or toads. It was as if the woods were empty other than me. I made myself sit up and nearly fell on my side. Holding out my arms to balance myself, I staggered to my feet, head swimming and full of music. Again, I called to my friends. Again, no one responded. I was dreaming. That was the only explanation that made any sense, but I could feel my feet pushing against the earth. I ached all over. This was too real for a dream. I looked for my phone. It lay smashed to pieces at my feet. Splintered remains of Greta's guitar also lay in a similar state. Wake up, got down, wake up. I pinched my eyes shut and took a series of deep breaths. When I opened them again, the world was unchanged. The loop continued, and I was still very much alone. I turned away from the quarry and re-entered the woods. I stuck to the path, occasionally bracing against the trees to keep from falling. The sample remained the same volume. When I reached the fence, I collapsed before worming my way under it. On the other side, I stood and fell against my car, I felt in my pockets for my keys. They weren't there, but I wasn't going back to the quarry. No fucking way. I headed down the gravel drive toward the street. Everything was dark and quiet, save for the haunting loop. I screamed, fell to my knees, and struck the pavement with my fist, but I had to keep going. At the very least, I had to find out what the hell happened to everyone. What the hell happened to me? I walked until I reached the stretch of road between Abiding Glory and Kip Creeper's trail of terror. The music mercifully died, but silence unmercifully took its place. Both the cemetery and Kip's trail were dark and uninhabited. The road would take me nowhere. I had to choose, the widening glory or the trail of terror. I headed for the trail's entrance, my footfalls the only sounds. Upon reaching it, I froze. Dozens of corpses hung from the trees lining the trail. All of them were in their late teens, maybe early twenties. The resemblance, the resemblance between them all was the most unsettling thing, though. Maybe the corpses didn't look exactly like me, right? Right? Every voice in my head screamed for me to turn back. They pleaded with me to go home, but home wasn't what it used to be. They pleaded with me to forget what I'd seen, but no such thing was possible. They begged me to wake up, and I didn't think I'd ever been so lucid as I was in that moment. I was witnessing some revelation, condemnation, deliverance, each being inseparable from the other. And I walked on into a nightmare of oblivion. Chapter 1, Fortune City. It was a hot day in Fortune City. The citizens slogged through the streets, tongues hanging from mouths, flesh glistening with sweat. The concrete was like a frying pan. This move. <laughs> Melting the rubber on tires and the bottoms of shoes. So when they first felt the cool breeze blow in, they were grateful, ecstatic really. People stopped in their tracks, eyes closed as they allowed the chilled air to sweep over them. Drivers stepped out of their vehicles to feel the arctic caress of this mystery wind slap against their sweat-soaked skin. There was a smile on every face, a collective sigh of relief. The sighs became screams when the giant bird cast its titanic shadow over the city, zooming over skyscrapers and highways. Its call was like a clap of thunder, so deep and loud that glass shattered on buildings and cars alike. The bird's eyes shone a dark violet color, like two giant, two giant black light orbs. The talons on its leathery feet were as black as ink, as long as sedans. Condoria, a woman screamed, clutching her child to her chest and pointing toward the sky. Oh, Jesus, run! Others made similar exclamations, and just as the citizens began to scatter, race in all directions, the massive bird squeezed out an egg. It was orange, the size of a house, shining as bright as the sun. The egg smashed into a building, cracking on impact. A wave of molten lava exploded out of the shell, splashing against the building and melting it almost instantly. Bright orange magma rained down in the streets along with liquefied metal and glass. The woman with the child pressed her chest, shrieked once, loud and shrill, before she and her infant were enveloped in lava. Two red skeletons stood in their place, but only for a moment before the bones collapsed and blended in with the rushing magma. 
Drivers were fused to their vehicles by molten metal and rock, only having seconds to scream in agony before their flesh sloughed off their bones. Condoria, perched on top of the melting globe, spread her bat-like wings. <clears throat> her wingspan was nearly, was nearly the size of the building she stood upon, an orange glow reflecting off the black, veinous membranes of her wings. She screeched, more glass exploded, car alarms went off. She launched herself from the building, swooped over the street. Her wings cut buildings in half as she flew, burying terrified citizens in rubble. She opened her razor-sharp beak and scooped up a mouthful of humans. They screamed, flailing and fighting each other to get out, to jump to freedom even if it meant death. But she slammed her beak shut at the same time with her talons, closed over more human flesh. Severed arms and legs, a few heads fell from her mouth, spraying blood as they dropped back to the broken concrete beneath. The few humans who had survived her clutching claws and who were still in her grasp, exploded into hysterics, thrashing to free themselves, surrounded by dead men and women who were impaled by the giant bird's talons. She flapped her wings, hovered over the street, opened her beak. Entrails and tattered flesh and splintered bone littered her mouth as she jammed one claw full of humans in it, crunching them into a thick red paste. Then the other claw full, blood and meat splashed to the street beneath her. The ground began to rumble then. The cool breeze that had only moments before brought a smile to every face in the city became an icy storm that cut flesh like razor blades. The sky turned to ashes as a heavy snow began to fall, coming out of nowhere, frosting the buildings and concrete in minutes. A mighty roar rang out, coming from the direction that most of the citizens were running toward. They stopped, tried to turn tail, but Condoria was there waiting, dropped another egg that cracked in the street, and sent a wave of molten lava toward them, incinerating the crowd. One man driving an 18-wheeler climbed out of the cab, stood on the truck's trailer. The vehicle lowered more and more as the lava melted it down. His skin was red, spewing sweat, but the man wasn't paying attention to that. His eyes were aimed toward the horizon, where the strong gusts of freezing wind were coming from, hitting him so hard he was nearly thrown right off his truck. The lava became a solid river of rock and metal, hissing and sizzling as the sudden winter cooled it almost instantly. It's, it's avalanche! He pointed a shaking finger as the giant stomped toward the city, towering over their tallest building, the fog caused by the frosty winds and snow was so thick that only the behemoth silhouette could be seen first. Each step it took covered miles, shook the very earth. In mere moments, avalanches appeared, giant icicles falling from his white fur and crashing to the street. One icicle stabbed straight through an SUV, pinning it to the asphalt. The driver within must have been mid-scream when the frozen lance hit him, entering his mouth and stretching it wide like a snake with its jaw on hinge. The corners of his mouth split all the way down his neck, spraying blood that froze instantly. Avalanche roared, smashed the building to rubble with a swing of his massive arm. The stone and metal and glass slammed down on the street, turning fleeing bodies into flattened spheres on the blacktop. The colossal beast opened its mouth, its eyes glowing a bright arctic blue, and unleashed a beam of icy breath that froze the horde of panicked patrons, some falling over and shattered on the ground like ice sculptures. The snow and sleet fell heavier now, the winds became more violent. Avalanche reached down with his massive hand, grabbed the human popsicles, breaking them into pieces as he clutched his fist, then tossed the frozen mush in his mouth. As he swallowed, he swung his arm again, totaling another building. Then another gust of wintry death breath, and another mouthful of human flesh slush. That was hard to say. <laughs> Condoria flew over the city, dropping eggs, unleashing the liquid hell, gorging on the hysterical humans who had nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Avalanche smashed buildings as easily as a child knocking over cardboard cutouts turning the once smoldering city into an icy wasteland. The monsters ate and destroyed until they had their fill, just like they always did. By the time the military arrived to defend the city, the kaiju were gone, leaving the streets covered in lava and ice and human remains. Jesus fucking Christ, one soldier said, then turned his head and vomited over a pile of bones. The air was still frosty, the snow still falling. The puke turned solid instantly. Avalanche, another soldier said, shaking his head and staring at the aftermath. And Condoria looks like. What's that? The most fearsome fucking kaiju in the world, man. Even if we made it on time, there wouldn't have been a fucking thing we could have done to stop him. I thought Tyranagon was the most fearsome. The soldier picked up a frosted skull, ran his thumb over the frozen teeth. He used to be, but he disappeared. That big fucker hasn't shown himself since the Eternal City incident. Eternal City. Those fucking giant fuckwads can't do shit to Eternal City. Yeah. 
This ain't no fucking eternal city now, is it? The soldiers shivered as they began searching for survivors, not expecting to find a single one. Okay, I'm gonna try to get through this next part. And what time is it? Time. Chapter two, a fucking embarrassment. <laughs> that was sick, Gigatar said, pumping his clawed fist as mom soared into their lair. What? Did you bring us a taste? Come on, I'm starving. Mom, you are awesome, Zapstress said. She grinned wide as blue electric current broke her black slit flesh. That city never stood a chance. Crick sat in the corner of their mountain cave, holding his knees to his chest. He'd watched the action along with his brother and sister, but he couldn't find it as exciting as they did. Anytime his parents went out on destruction trips like that, the footage played automatically in the kids' minds, seeing through their parents' eyes. Crick wanted to turn it off, but he couldn't. He had to watch as all those poor people were butchered, smashed and melted and frozen and chewed up. It made him sick. Sure, he'd eat the stuff. He had to if he wanted to live, but killing him was different. He wasn't sure if he could ever make himself do it, no matter how upset it made his parents, especially his father. Mom flapped her wings a few times, smiling wide as Gigatar and Zapstress showed her, showered her with admiration. Her long, scaly neck quivered as she gagged. Then she opened her beak wide and let the pile of meat spill from her throat. Reds and pinks and purples and grays, white bones sticking out here and there. The mush steamed as Dad entered the cave. He patted his belly and picked his teeth. Go ahead, kids, Mom said, and stepped aside as Gigatar and Zapstress dug in, stuffing their faces, moaning as they gorged the freshly heaved meal. She looked over at Crick, who stayed in his place in the corner, and watched his siblings feast. His stomach rumbled, but he knew better than to try and force his way in. He'd take whatever was left over, just like always. We'll probably have to suck the marrow out of the bones again. It's a fucking embarrassment, that said and said just the other night. It doesn't fit in with the family, Connie. What are we supposed to do with a fucking monster who's too much of a pussy to destroy anything? Crick had pretended to be asleep, wiping the slimy tears as they poured from his only eye. He's our son, Avil. That's all that matters, Mom had said. He'll come around. He's just special. That's all. A late bloomer. Gigatar slurped up a rope of purple intestine, licked his lips. Each of his four hands was digging into the blood mound, taking turns stuffing sloppy balls of meat into his mouth, his giant fangs crushing bone with ease. He shot Crick a look, smirked, then belched and snickered. Zapstress had her back to Crick, ignoring him as usual. She used her electricity to cook the meat before stuffing her face with it. Her eel-like body writhed as she, as she feasted. The electric current crackled as it jumped from her skin and popped in the air. Crick flinched when a ribbon of current burst just a few feet away from him. Memory of his, memories of his brother holding him down while his sister zapped him again and again flooded his mind. Crick, honey, Mom said. She tucked her wings and strolled across the cave. Aren't you hungry? Crick shrugged, pulled his knees in tighter. It was always hard for him to look his mom and dad in the face after they had caused so much death and destruction. Let him starve, Dad said. Sleep were precipitating from his mouth as he spoke. You want to eat? You need to fight for it. Survival of the fittest or some shit like that. You hungry, boy? Get your fat ass up and take your share. You don't ask for it, you fucking take it. Yeah, Crick. Come on over, I dare you, Gigatar said, spitting bone shards of blood from his red-painted mouth. Zapstress just laughed as she whipped her tail, shooting a bolt of electricity at him. It hit him in the arm and he yelped and jumped to his feet. That hurt, Crick said. Zapstress looked over her shoulder at him, shook her head and smiled. The meat in her hands smoked as she cooked it, then pushed it past her long, pointed teeth. Mom glared at Dad, hissing, standing tall and stretching her neck. Dad held his stare for a moment, then snorted and looked away, staring out of the cave and into the distant mountain ranges that surrounded their home. Mom opened her wings, flapped them hard and fast. Crick's brother and sister were lifted off their feet, thrown to the stone wall across the cave. They grunted, growled, then jumped back on their feet and faced their mothers if they were going to attack them. They quickly lowered their eyes and eventually escaped to their rooms. Go ahead, Craig, eat up, Mom said. Then leaned over and kissed him on the forehead, stroked his tiny, flightless wounds. Dad stretched out on the floor, rested his head on a pillow of snow. He yawned, smacked his mouth. Crystallized blood coated his lips, clung to his fur. He watched as Craig tiptoed toward the food and snorted again and shook his head. Then he turned so his back was to Crick and Mom, and within seconds was snoring. Each snore released a beam of icy breath that exploded out into the air, hitting mountaintops way off into the distance. 
Crick plopped down beside what was left of his parents killed. He absently grabbed a leg, mostly dissolved by long stomach acids, and popped it into his mouth. The pruned flesh was stripped from the bone as he scraped his teeth across it, and pulled it back out of his mouth. A tear escaped his eye, splashed on the cave floor, on the cave floor and froze. Mom sat beside him, wrapped one wing around him. Don't put too much thought into it, sweetheart. But you know, Dad's right. We're monsters, baby. Monsters destroy, kill. Without that, we're nothing. You understand that, don't you? Crick shrugged, poked at a woman's head with his finger. There was a bite taken out of her cranium, the brain spilling out. Crick scooped them up, sucked them up. Oh, this is for me. I don't know, Mom. Yes, I just don't get it. Why do we have to destroy cities all the time? And all those people, they never did anything to us. Why do we have to kill them like that? To survive. Those people, you know what they eat? Smaller animals. Or bigger, stupider animals. That's just the way it is. Everything is food for something else. Except for us. Crick thought back to all the training sessions he had with his parents. Side by side with Gigatar and Zapstris, his siblings were natural born kaiju. Destroying was automatic for them. They discovered their special abilities before they could even walk. But not Crick. He would always hurt himself somehow, get laughed at by his brother and sister. His father used to beat him, thinking it would toughen him up, accelerate the learning process. But instead, it only made Crick cry, run to his mother for support. Dad would make giant mock cities with, him, with his ice breath, and Mom would fly around the mountains collecting goats to act as fleeing people. Gigatar and Zapstris looked like they were having the time of their lives. Smashing ice buildings, devouring handfuls of goats. Crick, wanting so desperately to fit in and to impress his father, swung as hard as he could, smashing his fist into the nearest building. The ice didn't even budge. Crick's red knuckles split and bled, and he shrieked and fell to the ground bawling. The goats climbed his body and bawled, seeing him as no threat whatsoever. Well, maybe I wasn't supposed to be a monster, Mom. Maybe it was a mistake, you know? Crick scratched one of the black spots that covered his red, spongy body. They always itched, he used to drive me crazy, but he was starting to be used to it. Of course he was supposed to be a monster. You're part of the most feared family of kaiju in the world, don't you realize that? Your father and I, we're legends, baby. Parents tell stories about us to their children. People live in fear at all times, wondering if Condoria or Avalanche will come to their city, and one day, they'll say the same thing about you and your brother and sister. You'll see. Yeah, I gave it turn disastrous, but not me. They'll laugh at me. Their armies would kill me. It wouldn't even be hard. I don't have any special abilities. I'm just a useless pile of blubber. He scooped up the last of the masticated, semi-digested meat and filled his mouth, then wiped another tear from his giant eye. Crick, Mom said, holding him tighter, resting her beak on the top of his head. You'll find your ability. It's in you. All kaiju have at least one. You just have to find, you just have to search for it. Dig deep. I've tried. I've tried so hard, but, but all I can do is this. Crick squeezed his fists, strained so hard that his body shook. One of the black spots on his belly bulged, looked like a zit ready to pop. A tiny version of Crick pushed itself out and floated down to the floor as it flapped its miniature wings. Its skin was a lighter shade of gray, paler, diseased. Its eye was dark yellow, covered in pus that leaked down its face and into its mouth. It struggled to walk, dragging its feet, coughing and wheezing. Green phlegm sprayed from its mouth and splashed to the floor. It only made it a few steps before falling over, dead. Mom stared at the tiny version of her son, put on an obvious fake smile. Hey, I've never seen a ability like that. It's original at least, right? Crick rolled his eye and sighed. Dad was so mad at me when I first did that. I could see how disgusted he was just to look at me. He hates me, doesn't he? Just like Gigatar and Zapstras, they all hate me. That's not true. We're family. We might be proud, but we love each other. We stick together. You're not ashamed of me, Mom. I can't do anything. Crick never felt like he truly fit in. There were times he thought about running away or just jumping right off the mountain. He didn't think his family would even notice he was gone. Either that or they'd throw a party. Mom kissed him again, yawned. Stop talking like that, baby. We've got a big day tomorrow. What do you mean? Tomorrow. What's happening tomorrow? She curled up next to Dad, wiggled her body, and she settled in. Come on, Crick, you know. It's what you and your brother and sister have been training for. It's your first day. Oh my God, that's tomorrow? I'll be killed. Mom, no, I can't. You know I can't. Shh, quiet now, baby. Now. 
exhausted. You'll do just fine. I know you will. And then she was asleep, leaving Crick alone with his thoughts. Tomorrow, we're going to take the three of us to our first real city tomorrow. And they'll all laugh at me. Even Mom will be embarrassed to have me as a son when she sees me fail. Crick snuck past his slumbering parents, stood right on the edge of the cliff. Below him was a seemingly endless abyss of ice and snow and rock. Strong winds threatened to push him over, and he contemplated just tipping himself forward, letting the wind take him away. But his cowardice won, as it always did, and he went back to his corner, curled up, and dreaded the life. Almost done. Pelican Bay. Crick thought it was a silly name. It didn't seem very intimidating. Actually, made him feel a little bit better about the situation. This should be a piece of cake, Dad said. No messing around, though. Sometimes these little cities will surprise you. You remember Cyclopticon? Gigatar and Zapstress nodded, licking their lips as they stared at the city in the distance. Crick had never heard that name before. It was a city like this that did hit him. Hidden missiles blew his fat head right off his shoulders. Pelican Bay suddenly didn't sound so silly. Dad, Gigatar, and Zapstress waded through the ocean toward the city. Crick sat on Mom's shoulders as she soared over the water. Dad created a curtain of fog to hide them. One of you should be able to handle it, Pelican Bay, so the three of you should take it, no problem. I want to see smashed buildings. I want to see people screaming, running in all directions. You got me? I want total destruction. Eat all you can, kids. He pulled Gigatar and Zapstress close, hugged them, making me proud. Crick wanted so bad to be hugged by his father. He sighed from his mother's shoulders, crossed his arms. She turned her long neck so she could look back at him, smiled, rolled her eyes playfully. Then she pecked a kiss on his forehead before picking up speed and zooming toward the city. She was a great mother, the best mother a monster could ever ask for. Here we go, Crick. You can do this. I know you can. Below them, Gigatar and Zapstress roared as they approached the coast. It was time to put their training to the test.